Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, so I'm going to um, speak about something here that is, uh, I have a main collaborator on this, which is a, who's Dan Roy at the University of Cambridge. So basically when I'm speaking here, it might as well be Dan speaking. And um, um, we also learned a lot from uh, Cameron Freer at MIT, who is a model theorist. So if you, um, if you agree with a previous speaker that uh, practice is better than theory, then this is going to be the worst talk ever. <laughs> it's, uh, so what I want to tell you about is um, a bit more in the line of what, what Patrick was talking about earlier this morning. And it's very hard when you talk about a theoretical topic to a very mixed audience. It's very hard to pitch it. So I would, I would like to ask you to just, can you, who here has seen the Aldous Huber theorem before or the Definetti theorem or a graph limit? Okay, so that's about half actually. Great. So um, the general the general theme that I want to talk about is so I'm um, I'm not really a networks person. I'm interested in um, statistics of random structures, and um, what I mean by that is by by a random structure is something like a sequence or a graph or a matrix or you name it, but it's a random object. And now I observe one large random object, and uh, I would like to, to in some way do inference. Yeah? So if I observe a network, I observe a large network, which I assume is a snapshot of a huge underlying network or an underlying population. But I just observe one, let, one network, not many small networks. Yeah? And um, now for um, um, this idea of, th there is this idea in, uh, which is very important in Bayesian statistics of exchangeable random structures. And the idea here is the following. So you get, um, you have a, a random structure here the x is my random structure, and it's infinitely large. Okay? And now I have some kind of invariance property, which is uh, exchangeability. And if I have this invariance property, then this random structure, the distribution of this random structure decomposes in a very neat way. And the way it decomposes is, in general, is you have some set of very, uh, somehow much simpler distributions than these exchangeable distributions are in general. So distributions are very simple random structures. And then you mix over these, and that way you get all exchangeable random structures. Okay, so and that gives us some very um, important things for statistics. For one is that it characterizes um, kind of the maximal observation model of which we then choose a subset of models, and it explains what a parameter space is. It explains what statistical averaging is. It explains what sample size is, and it gives us a law of large numbers. Yeah. So here's. Um, the simplest example, the Definetti theorem, the simplest exchangeable random structure is an exchangeable sequence. So that means I get a random sequence and it doesn't matter in which order the observations come in. Yeah, it's a very simple assumption, or deceivingly simple assumption. If that is the case, then Definetti theorem tells me I get an integral decomposition like this, and the specific form looks like this. So what this says is, this here is an IID sequence. Okay? It's an IID sequence sampled from a distribution theta. And this distribution theta is random. So this is this object here. So here, this here, this distribution becomes the IID sequences with um, marginal distribution theta. And I'm drawing that theta at random. Okay. And um, um, so that tells me that the um, basically, the, the general observation model that I'm looking at are distributions on the sample space, so on individual elements of the sequence. That may seem like a trivial thing, but it breaks down a very complicated object, an infinite random sequence, into individual bits, its elements. Yeah? So in the sequence case, that is not very surprising. It just tells us in hindsight, it justifies in hindsight something that we would have been doing anyway. But in more complex random structures like graphs, the results are a lot more surprising. Yeah. And that is exactly the basis of what uh, Patrick was talking about this morning and work of uh, Peter Bickel, 2011 in the Annals, um, and some other recent work. Yeah. So um, let me show you this, this other result that Patrick also alluded to this morning. So this is this representation theorem for exchangeable graphs. So if I have an exchangeable graph, I get an infinitely large graph at random. And it's exchangeable, that means it's, its distribution is invariant under isomorphism. Okay? It doesn't matter which particular isomorphic instance of the graph I observe. Yeah? 
two iso any two isomorphic graphs have the same distribution. And the theorem that David Aldous first proved in uh, um, in 79 and independently Hoover and which was then extended um, by Kallenberg um, says this, if I have any exchangeable graph, I can always sample it like this. I sample a random function which maps the unit square to the unit interval. Okay, This function has to be measurable and we can always make it symmetric. Okay. So now, how do I sample my graph? I sample an instance of a an, sequence of IID uniform variables and think of each of these as attached to one of the vertices in the graph. And then, in order to decide whether there's an edge between node i and node j, I plug ui and uj in my function, yeah, two arguments. That gives me a value between 0 and 1. That's a probability, and I flip a coin with that probability. Okay? So that's a, I mean, that obviously is a way to generate a random graph. You can easily see that this graph is going to be exchangeable, yeah? that it does not depend how I label the vertices. Yeah? This here, these numbers here are the vertex labels, that those are exchangeable. Yeah? But the interesting thing is that actually any exchangeable graph can be sampled in this way. And associated with that, this comes in tau with a law of large numbers. So I'm just calling it a law of large numbers, but it's basically a law of large numbers. This is uh, due to Kallenberg in 99, and what this says is the following. I sample a graph um, of a finite size, and now I plot it as a checkerboard function on the square. Yeah? So if I have 10 vertices, I decide, divide this into 10 rows and 10 columns, and I color them black and white according to whether there is a 0 or 1 in the adjacency matrix. There's a plot of the adjacency matrix. But now this is a valid function on the square, so I can sample from it with the scheme. Yeah? And that is just uniform sampling from the graph. I sample uniformly, um, sample vertices from the graph, and look at the induced subgraph. Yes? So here, do you mean for the first theorem, is it for any infinite graph? Or yes. Is it true for finite graph? So it's, it, the, the exchangeability is um, a property of your data source. You don't have to observe an infinitely large graph for this to hold. You have to assume that if you were to continue sampling, then um, it would remain exchangeable. Yeah? So it's not like um, it's exchangeable when you sample, well, you sample the first n vertices, and then afterwards, suddenly, you get a non-exchangeability. Then this theorem holds. So it has to hold for the infinite object, but it's a, dis it's a property of the source, not of the sample. Yeah? But, yeah. That's right. Yeah, so you can, have, uh, um, you can have finite exchangeability, but that is not going to give you a representation theorem, right? But in a, for example, in exchangeable sequence, that would be the assumption that um, my sequence, the order of observations doesn't matter for the first n samples, and then a drift comes in or something like that, right? So um, um, if, I, if I make the, the assumption that my source generates data in an exchangeable way, then this theorem holds whether or not I'm going to observe something infinite. Yeah. Okay, so um, that is the first part. And then this law of large numbers here. What this tells me is if I now make this, this graph here larger, okay, and I plot it again on the unit square. I increase the number of vertices, I plot it on the unit square, then these checkerboard, uh, this checkerboard pattern here gets finer. right? And um, you can probably believe that if you keep doing this, this is going to converge to something smooth like this. Right? So this is the convergence that Patrick mentioned this morning. Okay. Um, this only holds up to reordering, though. Yeah? So you have an equivalency. I'm going to say a few more, a few more words about that. But, so this is reconvergence of the distributions defined by these objects. Yeah? The graph limit theory that Patrick already mentioned by Lovas and Sagedi defines metrics on these graphs and then looks at the convergence in terms of this metric to a function. So graph converges to function, but the two are actually the same thing. Yeah? So this theory has been around for 30 years, but what the graph limits people did, they filled in a lot more theory about the set of these functions and how they, how they work. Okay? So what that tells me for statistics is if I have an exchangeable graph, then I can estimate its distribution by estimating an object like this. Yeah? So I can do density estimation on graphs, basically by estimating a function like this. And um, Here's an example. So this is um, some work we did uh, 
um, one and a half or two years ago. So this is um, where we phrased this as a non-parametric regression problem. We know we have to estimate this, this function. Yeah? So um, function estimation is a regression problem. Here we did this in a Bayesian way by putting a, a Gaussian process prior on it. Okay, I'm not going to go too much into the details here, but basically um, just to get the idea, this here is a, um, an, an input adjacency matrix of a graph. Here I have plotted the graph. And here is an estimate of what this function looks like. Okay, so basically you can think of this as, um, um, if you if you remember how we sample from this by throwing on these uniform random variables, yeah, here on the on the edges, um, you can think of this as something like a local edge density. Yeah? So if you have a big blob here, that corresponds to a high edge density in some region of the graph, and that would be here in this case, it would be this region here. Of, of course, I mean these plots are always, you know have to be taken with a grain of salt. And um, um, this actually, this idea goes back in the, um, in the Bayesian non-parametric and machine learning literature for a while. So here I have, uh, I have a pl few plots of models that are around in the machine learning literature and you can see that, which are basically co-clustering models. Yeah? You can see that these functions are not symmetric. So this is where people are interested in, uh, in uh, undirected graphs. Yeah? Undirected graphs or more generally matrices. These two models here were, are basically reinterpreted in hindsight. Yeah, we know they are exchangeable, and so we can look at, uh, we can characterize them by looking at what kind of functions they, they generate. I would like to mention this paper here in, in, uh, in particular by uh, Dan Roy and Yi Te, who for the first time, as, um, as far as I can tell, invoked this idea of, um, of using the Aldous Hoover theorem in, um, in a non-parametric way. Yeah, and there's a previous paper by Peter Hoff in 2007, which is the first paper I know of that, that used the Aldous Hooper theorem in statistics. Yeah. Ah, machine learning. Ah. Okay, so um, now um, these, these pictures are somewhat deceiving because they are, uh, um, I mean, it's, it's eye candy, right? But uh, these graph ones are actually, these limit objects, these functions, they're actually pretty nasty objects. Mm -hmm. How much, un, until when do I have exactly? Um, All right, good. So, um, there's a problem here with, um, um, with permutation invariance. So what I've done here is I've taken this, um, this example of a limit object, I like to call this a Lovas graph one because it's a Lasso Lovas favorite example graph one. And it's just a min function, yeah? but it's a it's a very simple example of a function like this, which is not just constant, right? If we take this function as a constant, then we get exactly the Arduino model, right? So, what I've done here is I've uh, chopped up this function into ten by ten rows and columns, and then I picked a permutation of the numbers one through ten and applied it to each to both to the rows and to the columns separately. Uh, I mean, same permutation, yeah. So I get something that looks like this. Now, if you remember how we, this, this sampling procedure, my sampling procedure here, I start with this function and then I throw on uniform random variables. These are um, exchangeable, right? They are IID, so in particular, they are exchangeable. They don't have a particular order. And um, that means that the distribution of a graph that this defines and that this defines is exactly the same distribution. Okay? So these two functions parameterize the same graph. So from a statistics perspective, this, this Aldous Hoover theorem gives us a very nice way to parameterize these exchangeable graphs. It says the parameter space for statistics, the natural parameter space, are these functions, but the parameterization is not unique. Yeah? And you can see that this is not only, um, I mean, these are just two functions, but you can see immediately that I could have done this with 11 by 11 blocks or 12 by 12 or whatever, right? So there's an infinite number of ways that I can parameterize this function. Yeah? And in the limit of taking infinitely many blocks, you get something that is a measure called a measure preserving transformation. Yeah? I don't know whether everybody is comfortable with that term, but basically what it says is the distribution of the variables I throw on here on the sides is a uniform distribution. And any, any transformation of the interval that I can, can make that preserves this distribution, if I apply that both here and here, then I'm going to get an equivalent graph. Yeah? And it's even worse. Actually, the class of equivalent graphs is even a bit larger. You can't even get back and forth between all of them with measure-preserving transformations. Yeah? So. 
And, um, um, but, um, and this is really where graph limit theory started to develop things that were not around in Aldous Huber theory. Yeah? So, and I tried to put this together here for you in this diagram. So this here is a set of infinitely large graphs. Yeah? We sample a random instance in the set. This here is a set of probability distributions on graphs, and we're particularly interested in the exchangeable ones. Yeah? So now this law of large numbers type result tells us if we, if we observe a subgraph here of size n and we make it larger and larger, then we're actually going to get something that converges to the actual distribution. Yeah? So it converges to this specific object up to the permutation invariance. And this tells us something about sample size, right? What does it mean to have sample size in a graph? Because it's maybe not immediately clear. If we just observe, Patrick already mentioned this this morning, if we just observe one large object, what does sample size mean? How does it explain that? By explaining conditional independence, right? It breaks down the graph into these conditionally independent edges. Once we have observed this object and we have observed these uniform random variables here, let me just go back here. When we have observed this object, this function, and we have observed these variables, which, I mean, or we, we have fixed these variables, that makes the edges independent of each other. And that means if they are independent, if we have independent quantities, we can average over them, right? And that is what we need to do in order to do statistics. Yeah? We need to do some form of averaging. So this explains what statistical averaging means. Okay, so now, um, um, the aldous Huber theorem tells us that we can take the set of symmetric functions on the square to parameterize, um, to parameterize the, the measures which we can mix over to get the exchangeable distributions. Okay, so, but here, so this is our natural parameter space. Yeah, this would be in the case of just IID sequences or exchangeable sequences, this would be the set of probability distributions, but here it's a somewhat more interesting space. Yeah? But it's not unique. No. So parameterization is not unique. Now in graph limit theory, um, well, these guys are mathematicians, right? So what do they do? They take a quotient space. They say, okay, we have equivalence classes here. We just mod out these equivalence classes and we get a new space which consists of one point where each point is an equivalence class in the set here. Each equivalence class is collapsed into a single point. So these objects are completely abstract. Yeah? And there is a priori, there is no reason why we should be interested in them. But it turns out that this space here has extremely interesting analytic properties, and in a way, this is a central object of interest in graph limit theory. Yeah? Patrick mentions the Semerid irregularity lemma this morning, this fact that if you make a graph larger and larger, then it's not completely chaotic, right? At some point, if you make it large enough, this block structure emerges. The statement that this, this, the Semerid irregularity lemma holds is equivalent to the statement that this space is compact. Okay, so that's an analytic property of the space. It's equivalent to a deep result in graph, limit, in graph theory. And you can do that for a lot of results in graph, uh, graph theory. Yeah? That analytic properties here translate into results in graph theory and back. Yeah. Does it mean to be compact? So that means it's, um, um, if you're in a Euclidean space, it just means it's a closed and bounded set. Yeah, so it's the, um, but basically it's a continuous, space analog of a finite set. It's something where things don't get out of control because the set just goes too large. Yeah? Um, but so this is a, in, in analytic terms, this is a compact metric space and that is about as nice as it gets in analysis, yes. <coughs> yeah, right, so, um, so as I mentioned earlier, these guys introduced a metric here and that is a cut distance, right? So that is a pseudometric that is a pseudometric, but it becomes a metric by collapsing our equivalence classes. Yeah? Okay, and so you have this additional type of convergence here. This is according to uh, Lovas and Segedi, who, who um, um, developed this graph limit theory. The problem is, so if we have an, function, an object here as a function, we can sample it, right? We can actually generate a graph. These things are totally abstract, and there is no way to, that we can sample from them. So the question, a question that was open for a while um, was whether we can even get back from here to here in a measurable way. So what that means is we would like to have a map where I stick in one of these equivalence classes and it picks out one specific function in this equivalence class from which I can then actually sample. Yeah? And I mean, you can always invoke the axiom of choice and get that, but 
we would like to, this map to be measurable, not totally out of control. Yeah? And um, um, Balaj Segedi and I proved uh, two years ago that this map actually exists. Why, but the, why do you want it to be measurable? Um, otherwise, I can't, I can't make sense of a statement like, um, I pick an element here at random and it in induces a distribution here. Yeah, so the measurable, fun the, the non-measurable functions are the ones which are so, so brutally crazy that I can't even, um, the, the image under this function is not a random variable anymore. Yeah. What I missed was that you want to take a graph on at random. Or yeah. So, because what this tells me here is in, in, in theory at least, and so far it remains theory, in theory, this here is a unique parameterization of my space. This is not unique, this parameterization, but if I could do statistics with this as my parameter space, I would have a unique parameterization. Yeah. Now, of course, I understand that there are two types of randomness. There is a sampling scheme, yes. and there is taking a W at random. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, um, you want to take this W at random, for instance, if you are, um, if you, I mean, obviously, if you're doing Bayesian statistics, in which case you want to put on a prior. But even, even if not, you're still in a probabilistic framework and, and you need these functions to be measurable. Yeah? You, I mean. Not if you're in a frequentist view, right? You would have a W fixed and you take samples from this fixed W and then you want to say something about the W. Um, right, I mean, even in a frequentist setup, you would get into some kind of, of contradictory contradiction problem here because, I mean, you have a convergence of this random object to this. Right, and so these these become random objects, and then you would like to see this also converge here. Yeah, so you you, you really need a measurable map there. But maybe we can we, maybe we can continue that offline because my time is running out very quickly. So, what I just wanted to um, so this this result is an existence result. It's not constructive. We actually believe that there is no constructive proof, and it's. Uh, it's also not unique, yeah? So this, this selector here, which picks out this, this element, there's actually an infinite number of them, and none of them seems to be special, yeah? What I just want to illustrate with this is that these things are funny objects. We have these equivalence classes, and they are funny objects, okay? So why are they so complicated? In the, uh, in the Definetti theorem, um, in the Definetti theorem, we also have like a, a structure like this, and there we sample not here we sample a random function, and then we throw in these random variables, and then we make decisions, random decisions for the edges. In the Definetti theorem, we sample a random probability distribution, and then sample IID from that, right? So that is, first of all, that distribution is unique. Here we have something that is not unique. Second of all, in the, um, in the Definetti theorem, we have two layers of randomness. First sample probability measure, then sample IID from that. Here we have three. First sample random function, then sample these uniform random variables which impose an ordering, and then sample edges. Yeah? So why is this, why are not all kinds of exchangeability created equal? Yeah? And my, my hand wavy um, intuition for that is, um, that I think is, I believe is helpful, is the following. So if you think, look at this, this general integral decomposition, exchangeable structure here, then integral decomposition over here. Yeah? You can think of the exchangeability definition here as putting on constraints one by one. You start with one permutation, and you say my distribution has to be variant under that permutation. Then you put in a second, a third one, and so on, an infinite number of constraints. Yeah? The more constraints you slam on here, the more specific this representation becomes. Okay? So stronger constraints over here, more specific representation over here. Yeah? Now, in, uh, in case of these Struct two exchangeable structures that we looked at sequences and graphs. In the sequence case, the index set is the natural numbers, right? That's indexing a sequence. And the invariance is under all permutations of these numbers. Yeah. In the case of graphs, if I write them as a matrix, then the index set is n squared. I have a two-dimensional object. And now the invariance is only under permutations that act, that act the same permutation acting both on the rows and the columns. So I'm not I'm not permuting every entry of, of the matrix. I'm just permuting rows and columns because that means I'm permuting vertices and that makes sense, right? Otherwise, I would just randomly permute edges. So that means I'm only looking at a very special subset of permutations and that means I'm having less constraints here, yeah? I'm having less constraints here. 
and that makes the hypothesis of the theorem weaker. So I cannot deduce the Aldous Hoover theorem from Definetti, and the proof is much harder. Yeah? By the way, the proof is also a masterpiece. Yeah? If you if you're interested in this stuff, read that proof. It's uh, okay. Now, um, um, I was asked here to, I mean, or we were asked to talk about open problems, and I mostly want to talk about an open problem. So basically, I would like to have something like this that I've just showed you, but for network type graphs. Yeah? And this is really not, the graphs we get here are really not network type graphs. Okay? So um, first of all, they are dense. Yeah? They have too many edges. And you can see that very easily by taking this random function that we take. We get one specific instance of this function that we sample our graph from. And we integrate it over the square, or rather over the upper triangular. Yeah? The upper triangle of that unit square. That gives us exactly the, ed the edge density in the asymptotic case. So the ratio of edges that are present, that are on, in the infinite graph. Yeah? Now, this is either this function is 0 almost everywhere then this is zero, and the graph is almost surely empty. Or this is non-zero somewhere, then this is a positive number, and then you get a constant fraction of all the edges that could be there. So the number of edges in your observed graph of size n divided by the number of edges that would be in the complete graph, yeah, that converges to this number as n goes to infinity, and that means the number of edges behaves as some constant times order of n squared, and that's still n squared. Yeah? So you get a constant number of a constant fraction of the edges that could be there is there. Yeah? Now, you can address that. Um, okay, so first of all, first of all, this is not a property just of exchangeable graphs. It's actually a property of exchangeability. Exchangeable sequences have this too. If you take an exchangeable binary sequence, then Definetti tells us it's conditionally Bernoulli, conditionally IID Bernoulli with some unknown uh, Bernoulli parameter p. But that means that the limiting ratio of the ones that are present in the sequence is exactly p. So this is, again, either it's 0 or it's some constant fraction that is present. Yeah? So that is also a density property. So exchangeable random structures in general have a, have a density property. And you can, uh, um, you can address that by what Patrick described this morning, by attaching a rate. Right? So um, you, you multiply this function here before you sample on from it. You multiply it with a rate that depends on it. And uh, um, so um, um, the problem with that is that, the, um, that you're basically just thinning out your graph. Yeah? So if you sample from a dense object like this, the one that I estimated before, and, um, and that I estimated from this graph, I'm never going to see this graph. I'm going to see something that's blotchy. right? And you can, you can justify using these approximations in Patrick's framework or in Peter Bickel's framework. Yeah? But if you really want to have a generative model which looks like this, you're never going to get that. Okay? You're never going to get that with an exchangeable model. So we need some kind of invariance property, and I have to make this very quick. We're going to need some kind of invariance property if we want to make this possible that, um, that is, so to obtain a Definetti style result for this, for, for network-like structures, we need an invariance property that is weaker than exchangeability, okay? But it's stronger than, this is something I didn't get to, but, but there is another kind of invariance, like shift invariance in the network. You say, okay, in the net, I sit in a network, and I, I look at how the distribution of the network around me looks as I move along the network, yeah? And that is exactly what corresponds to local weak convergence, yeah? But that is too weak, yeah? It has a limit, it has a limit theory, but that does not give us any kind of, of statistical decoupling or something like that. Yeah? And um, we've been thinking about this problem for a while. We've been talking to a lot of people about it. And it seems there's really no solution at present. Yeah? So this is my open problem. Please help me. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>